for joining me today. Even though I'm speaking to you from the past, uh, I'm really glad that we could all make it here today. And I think present me is in the chat. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, feel free to hit me up there. Um, there's probably also somebody from Docker there. So I'll have two of us to answer questions for you. So the last mile of local containerization. What does that mean? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, but in short, let's first talk about who I am. I am Peter Valdez. I'm here in New York City. I've been writing code in some form or another for 14 years at this point. Uh, for the last five, six years, has been a bit of a Docker and Kubernetes focus. Uh, also involved with a bunch of local tech organizations here, uh, NYC Mesh, Store Digital, I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, and two random facts, I use NeoVim, I use Emacs, totally fine. Um, and I'm a fan of uh, Ludwig Goransson, uh, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but he makes great soundtracks. Check him out. So the problem, right? The last mile of local containerization, what does that mean? So. Today, lots of projects have been containerized, right? So they work with Docker in some form or another, um, things are running in containers. But the problem is that a lot of these projects have pieces of the app sitting outside of containers, right? So people are running npm start or some sort of command outside of the containers. And so they're kind of in a mixed container workflow, not really fully containerized. All right, so that last mile, so that's what the last mile is there that last mile that's not containerized, that 10% that remains outside of containers, ends up being quite a bit of a headache for pretty much any team at a software company. So how do we fix it? Thankfully, the solution, at least in words, is pretty easy. Uh, we need to run everything that we can. Really, you should be quite strict about it. You should run everything inside containers, right? So. No more in running NPM or Python or poetry or whatever your tooling may be. We shouldn't be running that directly on our computers. We should be running in containers uh, because if you need to have that on your computer, now there's dependencies that aren't really captured in Docker file, um, which is really the whole point. So the way that we'll kind of go through this and talk about how to do this and how to get what are often the last pieces of the app into containers. Um, we'll look at a starter app. Then uh, that starter app has a bunch of goodness in it that we've developed here at my company, Shipyard. Uh, we have basically what we say is batteries included in the app, right? So we'll talk about all the pieces there and how we've containerized all the tricky pieces, right? The pieces that a lot of people and a lot of teams tend to leave outside of containers. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about why should we do that and uh, why why should any company invest time into fully containerizing? So we'll start with the starter app. Uh, it's a React front end, it's a Flask back end. Uh, we'll take a look at it in a second. Um, but everything that we're doing in this talk, everything that we're talking about, everything that we show on slides is contained in this repository. So feel free to go to the link, it's down there, github.com slash shipyard slash React Flask starter and go to that link. Um, and if you're starting a fresh project and you want to start with um, React and Python, this is a great place to start. So let's take a look at that. And let's pull up the React desktop. So here's the starter app, right? You can go here and just to be clear that I'm not really doing any fancy magic here, we'll even do a fresh clone. So let's do the following. Let's go up the directory. And let's take a fresh clone of this project. So we get clone. Great. Good status. Everything is clean. No magic happening here. All right. So let's take a look at this guy run. Right. So we'll talk about making a second, but let's just get it run. Goes through the build, starts up the database, runs the single migration that's there, and then it starts up. Great. So that should start up pretty quick. There's the back end. And 
and ear fills the Z from it. Okay, that's one more plus. There we go. <laughs> Even demos in the past have problems. Great. Okay. Anyway, so here we are. This is the starter app. So we've set it up with a bunch of components, a bunch of examples, so that right from the start, you're not starting from scratch in a blank page. You have a bunch of components set up. You have a few endpoints set up. You have um, a couple of libraries in there, right? So we listed here on the front. We have material UI in there, bootstrap um, if you need it. We have uh, celery. We got SQL Alchemy. We have we have it all. So you need to start a new project. This is a great place to start. Uh, all right. So let's talk about what makes this starter app so special. Why is it fully containerized compared to a bunch of projects that are containerized, but not really fully. Right? They leave the last bit out of containers. Right. So let's start with the obvious one, Docker Compose, right? Docker Compose, you'll still find setups that uh, teams claim to be containerized, but actually they're just straight up running Docker, standing up a few instances of a few different services, other services are running outside of container, uh, and there's not even any coordination going. On. You will find that in the wild. So, just step one, right? Use Docker Compose. Right? It'll do all the coordination you need to do. It's been around long enough now that most of the considerations that you need um, or have in the local setup are there. And also, so if you're a shop that is going to deploy to Kubernetes, you might have the thought, you know what? Let's just run Kubernetes locally. Um, and in fact, Docker for Desktop does have that. But what we have found uh, with different teams is the app developers, right? So these are the developers who don't have DevOps knowledge, end up having a bit of a hard time working with local Kubernetes because the second that anything goes wrong, they have to dig into logs and they don't know how to do that. Um, they basically have to learn Kubernetes in order to diagnose what's going on with the app that they're working on. Docker Compose is a much better interface. Right? Docker Compose will basically, in a single terminal, show you all the logs that you need. And the second that something blows up, the app developer will see it without needing to dive into pods and services and ingresses, you know, anything that you might need to deal with in Kubernetes. Right? Um, another thing is the Compose spec has its own life outside of Docker at this point. So what this means is uh, the Compose specification is its own thing. Right? So that's not tied to the life cycle of Docker, um, which is a good bet that it'll be around anyway. Um, but it just guarantees that the community is now the one that's keeping the Compose specification alive. So you don't have to worry about, is this spec going to be around? Um, key note here is, as much as you can, put things into the Docker Compose file, right? Uh, ports, environment variables, all of this is contained. So what this ends up giving you, if we take a look here, right? Uh, this ends up being a great overview. If you're fully containerizing your app, you have every service in here. Anybody can jump into this project, take a look at the Docker Compose file, and they know really all the pieces that are at play. Right? Because basically you define each piece of the service uh, and each service as a whole in here. Right? So whether you're building it, whether you're pulling it from somewhere, what are the environment variables? Here's an environment file. What are the volumes that you're mounting? What are the ports? Right? All these things captured really densely right, uh, inside these compose files uh, is a very useful thing. All right, so one of the main things that tends to be a bit of a pain point for people when they're trying to fully containerize is that they need these containers to run in different ways. Right? So they have a backend that runs in one way in production, but when you're developing against it, you want to have some certain debug flags enabled. So you want to run this in a different way with a different command right and so people then kind of say hey you know i can't do build this image so i might have to have a few different images in order to run my code this is not true you don't need to have duplicate doc files uh, if you have size considerations later on once your team is down the line um, that's a different story but for most teams what you can have is basically just have a file that you run at startup right Having a file that you run at startup to determine what to do in a container is a very common practice and it's very useful. Right? So the example that we have here 
um, is a Python app that's being run via Poetry you know, to manage the environment. And if dev mode is true, it's going to run just with straight up Flask, and that'll pick up some debug flags, and then you can do your debugging and something goes wrong. Or if it sees, okay, you know, dev is not true, so it's going to run in its full U whiskey form. Right? So basically, with this dev environment variable, you're able to toggle is this going to run in development mode, or is this going to run in production? And so we will see that here in practice. So let's kill this app. Okay. And let's say we want to, let's just make it extra clear. So if we run with dev true, we do make develop. We're going to log the back end once it starts up. To go into control. Well, the back end, we see here this is running in dev mode, right? Flask app, debug mode on, running with uh, WorkZug. Here's a debugger pin. All right. Okay, fantastic. So let's kill that. And let's say dev mode is false. We'll give that a second to start up. And we will see that now this is going to have a different set of logs because now it's going to be running in basically production. All right, great. We see a whole bunch of different logs here, right? Compared to the small flask logs that we have here, we have this look long, full set of USB logs. Here, right? So this is running in production mode. And all we did, again, is we killed this. You can see dev mode true, dev false. Set that and you're able to change entirely how your container is run. And all you need is basically a file that you run at startup, which you can define uh, either in your Docker file or in your compose file. All right, auto reloading. Auto reloading uh, is another common reason why teams will basically keep certain workloads or apps or components of apps outside the container. Right? They'll say, if it's in the container, I can't uh, have auto reload working, which is just a no go, and I have to do a full rebuild of my image, uh, and it just doesn't work. Right? The way around that is you mount files directly into your container. Right? So. If you have some sort of service that's running in your container, let's say you have a node container, let's look at this diagram here. You have a node container, and in it you're running npm start, which triggers some webpack dev server, which is auto watching some directory, and every time a file changes, it's gonna rebuild. Great. The way that you have it actually reflect your code changes is you mount code directly from your laptop into the container, right? You're kind of overriding, overlaying the directory, your source code directory into the container. So actually the container is seeing the files that live on your computer, on your laptop, right? And the notation for that is this right here, right? So the volumes definition, the volumes property of the service, right? And so I say there's two pieces here, right? There's, if you see there's a colon here and it separates the two sides, it says, hey, this directory on my laptop, I want to be inside my container at this directory. Right? And we do this for two things. We have some public assets and we also have code. Right? So we want both things to be re reflected dynamically in the container. And you can do this with several containers at once. Right? There's no reason why you can't. You can absolutely get it working so that you have different code, the front end code mounted into the node container, and you have the back end code mounted into the backend container. So let's take a look at that working. So let's just run it and develop. I'll give that a second. And we are going to Y edit some code. So let's go to app.js. 
container is basically like the entire page. So what we will do here is, you know what? I want a little more contrast here. I want this whole background to be black so I can see these cars above. And I don't want to reload this page. This is a fresh clone. Remember, this is a fresh clone of a project. I just ran make develop uh, to run the code. And I'm now just going to edit a file. And I haven't done anything else. Literally clone, run, edit file. I go here. I say, I'm going to make the background color black. I do this. Roll this. Make sure they get reflected. Okay, let's choose something else. Let's say I put it here. Roll that. <laughs> what do I do background? And what if I do background? Oh. Okay. You'll have to forgive me, dear watcher. Uh, basically, well, for one, obviously, you can see I'm not that great at CSS, but number two is that that was a stale load of the page. So what we're going to do here is let's try that one more time. Fantastic. So there we go. No refresh needed. Fresh clone, run the project. Edit the file, auto reloading, working from the start. Right? And this is again all running in the container. And you can see every time we save, we see a bunch of fun in there. Right? Great. Okay. Do it again. Compiling, more fun in there. Okay, so this is all working. And what what is the point? Right? Why do you want to do this inside containers? If you weren't doing this inside containers, you would need to have some sort of library package, language specific code software installed on the host, right? Not inside the container. And so if you were running NPM start directly on your laptop, now every developer that's going to run that project has to have the specific version of Node that you're running this. And you're back into this whole dependency management, problem, right? which is the whole point of Docker. We don't want to have to manage that. We don't want to have to say, okay, uh, developer manually install these dependencies, if it's all captured in the Docker file, then all you need is to run Docker, compose up, and run, directly run the image, and you will have all the language-specific code, all the language-specific tooling at the right versions to do what you need to do. Right? We don't want to go back to the world. Right? This is why we're here at DockerCon. We don't want to go back to the world where you need to manage specific versions on your host. They should all be captured in containers. So another thing is very often people will build their workflow commands. So when I say workflow commands, every project has a bunch of workflows. You need to run the project. You need to stop the project. You need to clean up the data of the project. You need to create the test data for the project. You need to run the test. People will often define these and run, directly run these uh, with the language specific tool. Right? So if I have five different kinds of uh, projects, each in a different language at a company, that's five different sets of software and tooling that I need to manage. Right? But if we can standardize, as we've done here at Shipyard, you can just standardize and say, hey, the only requirements for these projects are two things. You only need Docker and you only need Make. Right? Make, pretty old software. Um, but still does a fantastic job. It basically just runs commands for you. It does a lot more than that, but you can use it in this way so that it effectively is just a way to memorialize what are the sort of workflows that you run in your project. So we can see here in the example, what are different things you can do, right? So, and you can even combine things. So I can say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is how you stop the project clean. Build is how you build it. Run is how you run it, right? All Docker Compose commands. Um, and you can even say, hey, if you want a front end shell, this is, you know, you can get it like this, it's back end shell, Python shell, et cetera. Uh, and you can combine things to say, hey, this is a full workflow. Make develop as I've been running on the side over there. Basically does a clean, uh, a build, a migration upgrade, because there's migrations to make sure the database is in the right state, uh, and run. So if you use make and Docker, you can run any kind of software in your organization, right? And you'll also have a nice side effect of 
the make file will show what are the things that are commonly run in this project? What are the things I need to know how to do and often run to be an effective contributor to this project? All right, so let's take a quick look at that. So what we can do here is, if I do a make clean, that's gonna stop the project. No, um, which it ended on. Ah, uh, yeah, that'll just, okay. Well, we can also do things like just run one of the specific commands, right? So I can also just say, hey, I just want to do the build. I just want to do the running. I want to just run one of the migration things. Right? You can directly run it. So make will allow you to basically run anything that you want uh, in command form. And it's, again, language agnostic, which is, again, a very important concept when it comes to Docker images. All right, secrets, right? So there's a secret file uh, that tends to live in most projects, um, or they're split up in different people's environments in different ways, and everybody's managing it in their own way. Um, this seems to be kind of, maybe to some people, a bit of an obvious point, but you see all sorts of secret management across different projects. Um, and so I'm just here to tell you, one of the simpler ways is just have a single environment file that you share with your team, um, and again, share it safely. You know, Shipyard, we do it with PGP. Everybody has a public key, private key, and that's how we share files. Um, and so if you actually have your environment contained in a single file, what can you do? You can just share that file, run Docker Compose up, and that's it. You're fully running the software in the way and in the state that it's running for everybody else and every developer on the team. So all you need to do is, again, clone the project, get the secret from somebody, say, hey, start the project up, done. You are in full run form. And quick note, you know, as much as you can, don't reference environment variables outside of containers um, because then you're going to start getting into the potentially bad habit of having logic outside of containers, which is going to mean more dependencies that you need to manage. Uh, and a final quick tip is, this over here is actually a file, a JSON file. So what you can do is, if you have a file that you want to put into a container, you can do that by running it through a base64 encoder and just putting it in your environment. And then inside the container, you just load it back up. Right? So base64 uh, is a really useful encoding to turn files into strings and then strings back into files. Base64 encode, base64 decode. All right, and then the fast cherry on top. Uh, a lot of the complaints around fully containerized setups tends to be around its building time, right? So first off, in the latest versions of Docker, BuildKit is uh, enabled. So actually you're getting quite a bit uh, of speed up there already, but there is this less known uh, build command called docker build x big. So I'll show you the, that and just how fast that is. All right, so let's do a bit of a manual thing here. Let's say uh, Docker, BuildKit, yeah, let's turn it off. And let's say Docker BuildKit 0, Docker Compose Build. You see already, this is taking a while. It's going through this. Fine, you know what? Control-C. Let's build it with Docker build kit on. So that's going to be pretty damn fast. Great. So that's really fast, right? So let's time that. Let's run that again. Wow, fantastic. Great. Um, should we not just do that? I'm trying to help this. Let's do this one more time. Run it again. It's about three seconds. Okay, pretty fast this time. Okay, great. Let's now do this. So the difference here is when you're doing a build kit build, you basically are running with the fancy new build kit build, but each service sequentially. Docker build X bake actually submits all of your builds at once so that you actually have everything done super quick. Okay much, much faster, even 
than even that. Yeah. Okay. With all those things in mind and ways to turn a project into a fully containerized project, what do we get out of that? All right, number one, we get the fact that any developer can run any software within an organization, just two requirements. If you even want to boil it down to just Docker, great, but if you have make, then they can have all the commands, all the workflows, and they can run and build anything. And so literally two requirements, make Docker, you can run all of the software from day one, right? And if you have secret sharing easily in place, they can run it for real from day one. Right? So this actually fulfills the promise, right? Of it works on my machine, right? Uh, Docker is trying to eliminate, hey, it works on my machine, but it's not working on theirs. If you are using Make and Docker, you actually can fulfill that promise, right? You can actually say, hey, there's actually nothing that's running outside of these containers. Uh, so this problem of something working over there because they're running NPM start and with a certain version of node and I have a different version of node, that problem should be. Number two is that there is much less DevOps pain, right? If you are having a different local setup and you're running things in a weird way locally and it's different from how things are being deployed, um, that's going to be a problem. Right. So if you're running things outside of containers, you are very much going to be different from production. And that's going to cause pains in your deployment pipeline. Um, because basically you're going to have to rewrite some logic. Right? Like, so things that you're doing on your laptop, you're going to have to rewrite for your deployment pipeline. Uh, this also means fewer bugs for a QA to catch. Right? So if you are running the same way across environments, whether it be local, whether it be production, whether it be any environment in between, this is going to eliminate a whole class of bugs and there's less work for you to create. Finally, you can use a really kind of fancy set of tooling that, um, and at this point not even fancy, it's just really effective. If you are building your containerized projects to be fully containerized, everything is captured within a container, then what that means is that you're able to actually use these tools, right, which are actually on the major clouds at this point, right? on AWS, on GCP, and a whole slew of other new tools which are up here, and which say, hey, if you're fully containerized, you get all of these fancy new features, and you can deploy to Kubernetes over here and have all the environments over there. Right? And so one of the actually tools that allows you to do that is the startup that I work for, right? which is Shipyard. Shipyard is a tool right, where if you just have this one compose file, we will be able to spin up any kind of environment for you, right? automatic PR environments, demo environments, production. We can deploy it anywhere. So that means we can host it for you or we run it on users' Kubernetes cluster. And we can also collaborate with these environments. These environments uh, are all accessible on the internet, protected by an authentication layer but made with a shareable generated URL, right? So you can work with anyone on your team, spin up as many environments as you want and say, hey, can you take a look at this feature that I'm working on and get feedback much earlier in the week. So if you containerize your project properly, you're able to use a whole bunch of great new tooling that's been appearing and will continue to appear um, as time moves on. So that is it. Thank you very much. You can email me here, peter at shipyard.build. Um, you can visit our website. We have GitHub, uh, github.com slash shipyard, where you can get the starter repo that we referenced here. And you can actually hit us up on Twitter as well, if you so feel. So thanks. Feel free to reach out to me. And I hope you'll learn good enough. Thank you. Have a good rest of DockerCon.